Uh, I am Lauren Esposito. I'm the curator of arachnology here at the Academy. And today I'm also your seminar speaker. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about mostly is a collection of things that I've never spoken about together. But like most of them, I've spoken about at some point, somewhere, somehow. Um, but this will be the first time having them all in one place. But what I wanted to start with is just sort of, I think, like, the philosophy that's emerged in our lab. Hey, Allison, will you close that door? It's so bright. Close it up. Oh, thank you. Um, that's been emerging in our lab, I think, over the last few years. And, and it's something that I'm really proud of and something that we spend a lot of time collectively talking about as a group that that I feel like is worth highlighting sort of where, where, we, where we came from and how we got here. Um, but I always like to start almost every talk I ever give with this quote that was written by Dr. Sarah Cruz sitting right there uh, in her infinite wisdom. Uh, and it was in a paper that was like sort of, you know, not one of those papers that not a lot of people read. It was a paper that was a taxonomic inventory of a tiny place on a tiny island in the Caribbean. Well, kind of a big island actually, but um, in, in the discussion, she wrote this, and it's really stuck with me ever since. And I think it really kind of resonates because it sums up why I feel like I should keep doing this work. Uh, and it reads, because we live during a time when human development is altering the natural environment at an extremely fast pace, we're often placed, we being scientists, in a race to discover, collect, and describe organisms before they go extinct. And this is not a race that we're winning. And so I always like to think that we're just missing the right motivation. And so oftentimes when I'm thinking about how to do work and who's included in work, I think back to this statement and try to think about what the motivation should be to overcome this, this seemingly intractable problem of documenting what lives on Earth before it disappears. And I think one way to do that is by removing disparities in natural history or biodiversity research. And so I think in order to do that, you have to turn to your own subfield. Like natural history is quite a, quite a broad um, array of, of different disciplines focused on different areas of the world. But the thing that I'm most close to is, rep is entomology. And so there was a really great publication that came out of a collective called Entomologists of Color, published in 2020. And what they wanted to examine is what's the state of affairs in entomology? And so they collected data from the National Science Foundation uh, annual survey of graduate students uh, or of graduates. Um, and they pulled the, the subdiscipline of entomology and parasitology, which when we talk about arachnology, that's the closest we can get. There is no checkbox for arachnology on that survey or any other survey that I'm aware of. But generally, I would say that most arachnologists fit within the broad array of entomology and parasitology. And they looked at this data and compared this data to sort of the federal averages. And what they found was overall, in entomology, people are proportionally represent, underrepresented. There's not that many entomologists compared to the US population. Um, but when you look at people of color in entomology, it, they fare significantly worse. Uh, what you can see here is um, these sort of circles, and the circles represent overrepresentation or underrepresentation. Um, and you can see that there's sort of a gray rim around each of the circles to the left um, in the dotted box. And that means underrepresentation with co when, when compared to the general US population. And for black or African American entomologists, they're significantly underrepresented, both in terms of male and female representing people. And, and uh, in terms of Hispanic or Latino representing or representatives, it's even worse, especially for, for men. Uh, so there's very few men in the United States going into entomology. And I think that that's sort of, for me, probably a reflection of arachnology. If I had to guess, I would say that just within the arachnology subfield, the, the, the um, statistics are pretty similar. But we can look, uh, and there's actually some folks uh, here in the building now, and Holmquist, who have, who have done some research specifically on the representation of women. And we can look at the representation of women in the American Arachnological Society, the biggest society here in North America. Uh, and we see really similar trends not favoring women today. Um, these are the percent, percentage of women among different categories within the American Arachnological Society. We can see of all presidents, they're about a third. Of current members, they're just over a third. Of all directors, they're about 
a quarter. In the most recent board election, they're only a fifth. And oddly enough, in the current board, they're overrepresented. And so while it might seem that we're, that we're having really good representation at the board level, when you look across the trajectory of, of all these different categories, women are really significantly underrepresented. We can also look at sort of the proportional representation in publications in arachnology. Uh, and what Anna did is she looked at a few time marks in the history of the Journal of Arachnology, 1974, 1990, 2010, and 2020, to sort of look over time what's happened uh, within arachnology. And what she found is that uh, women first authors are less than 25% of all publications. So this is a holding steady line. It's not changing, it's not improving. Um, and at the percent, an, another group, this uh, Society for Women Arachnologists, which is based in Latin America, it's a collective of women arachnologists. What they found is that the percentage of abstracts at the 2019 Latin American Arachnology Congress, which is the largest Congress in Latin America for arachnology, 25% um, of the abstracts were only written by men. So no women, not even as co-authors. Uh, and, and if we look at, at sort of major journals that publish biodiversity science, um, like species descriptions, what we find is that in Zootaxa, which is probably one of the most used journals, only one in 15 women are on the editorial board as of 2019. So marginalized scientists, are their contributions in arachnology are consistently being devalued. Uh, and so I think historically, recognizing the contributions of women and of other people uh, from marginalized backgrounds like people of color has been a problem. And so, um, one of the ways that, that we can address that is by acknowledging our past and really looking to tell those stories. And one of the ways that we've done that here at the Academy is through the work of, of a, a large group of people working in, the, in our library and archives, including Kate Montana um, and a bunch of careers in science students and some undergraduate students and our head librarian, Rebecca Kim. And what they did is they started to look through the archives of the Academy, looking for stories of marginalized scientists who maybe hadn't had their stories as uplifted as other scientists from, from overrepresented backgrounds. And one of the people that came up in this archival work is the story of Harriet Eggsline Frizzell. Uh, and this work is published in um, the Bulletin of the Society of Systematic Biology as of last month. And Harriet, to my knowledge, is the first woman to have received a PhD in arachnology. Um, she, she never held a paid position in her entire life, um, even though she did both a PhD and a postdoc at Harvard. But she mentored a lot of young arachnologists, and that was one of the things that, that Kate found in her archival research on Harriet, was just the number, the sheer number of letters that were written to Harriet that were contained in her correspondence archives that, that talked about how she had mentored them or, or thanked her for her mentorship. She worked independently and she published and collected throughout her life. And she was also the de facto curator of the Academy's arachnology collection, which was shipped to her in St. Louis. She would curate it and ship the specimens back here to the Academy. So she was never paid for, paid for that work. Um, and I, th I love this quote that, that Kate came across um, when she was doing her research. And it's from B. Vogel, who was one of the first women presidents of the American Arachnological Society. And she found this, uh, she said this, I guess she must have been at this meeting. Uh, when Harriet was asked how she got interested in spiders, she explained that she'd had a vivid dream in which God came to her and told her to do her thesis on Agilinids and Pisaurids of the Pacific Northwest. And Willis Kirch, who was probably the most um, well-regarded and well-renowned arachnologist at the time, replied, wow, that's remarkable. I had the same dream, only God told me to work on crab spiders. So I think it, it really sort of gave me a better sense of Harriet's personality. If you wanna visit Harriet's portrait, it's hanging in my office, come by anytime. Uh, another thing that we've been working on is, is really trying to understand how the bias in research affects our taxonomic productivity. And so we undertook this, this project uh, a couple of years ago where we wanted to try to understand what taxonomic effort means. What does it mean to work on a group? I think so often we use something being understudied or underrepresented in collections as an as a argument for why our work should be funded, which I think is a really important argument. But often that's almost always subjective and rarely is it objective. And so we set out to try to figure out if there was a way to find 
a metric for evaluating how much work has been done on something. And in particular, what we wanted to do was, lo was look at whether there's a phylogenetic bias for this um, metric, meaning like people just like certain groups of spiders, like maybe they like tarantulas the best, and so the tarantulas are the most well studied. Or maybe there's a zoogeographic bias. We're really excited about working in the Amazon, and so it's the most well studied. Or maybe there's a socioeconomic bias where um, areas in the global south which have less funding available to do research are have groups of organisms that are less well studied or well documented. And so we came up with this like, kind of simple idea. We basically decided that if a, any given group has more species descriptions compared to other activity, like synonymies or all the other taxonomic changes that you might formally engage in, that that means that it's got a positive taxonomic effort. And if it has fewer species descriptions compared to other activity, then that means that the more taxonomic effort is probably going to yield uh, non-protolog, so like those kinds of changes like synonymies. So the plus means if we make more effort, we're going to find more species, and the minus means if we make more effort, we're gonna, not going to find very many species, but we're going to do really important work of revisionary taxonomy. And so what we used was the World Spider Catalog, which is the most comprehensive taxonomic catalog for any animal. Uh, and it was a really great place uh, to turn to as, as a result of that. Uh, and so we took all this data, and actually what we had to do was manually sort all 50,000 species um, and assign them to a zoogeographic region because that information wasn't available in the World Spider Catalog, but we did it nonetheless. Uh, we log transformed that data and we evaluated those three axes. First, the phylogenetic bias. What we found was that there's some phylogenetic bias evident in spider taxonomy. Um, for example, in the Synspermiata, uh, you see this phylogenetic bias where there are more species descriptions um, would result in more, the discovery of more species, which is not that surprising because these are really, really tiny spiders, like minuscule spiders. So it's not that surprising to imagine that if we looked harder for them, we'd find more species. We also found a similar taxonomic bias in the megalomorphs, which is a bit surprising because tarantulas are so iconic and so loved in the pet trade. Um, it's a bit surprising that, that, that we might, more effort might uncover a lot more species. Um, and it has really significant implications because most tarantulas are listed on the IUCN red list. And finally, we did find the opposite effect in some cases, like in wolf spiders, which are really abundant um, throughout the sort of Nearctic. Um, we found that, that more taxonomic effort in wolf spiders would likely yield in fewer species discoveries, but more revisionary taxonomy. And the next thing we evaluated was the zoogeographic bias. And what we wanted to see was the number of species described through time from each taxonomic region. And while this is maybe uh, makes a lot of sense after the fact, it wasn't a hypothesis that we had going into it. And what we found was that there's a plateau that correlates in many of the places in the global south course, uh, that, that, fall, that correlates with the fall of colonialist expansion. So when colonial powers backed out of neotropical areas and backed out of Pacific um, regions of the world, and in particular, th this was most evident in zoogeographic regions that are comprised prim primarily of islands. Uh, and so for us, the inference there is that as these colonial powers left, while they were there, we saw a, st a st sharp incline in the number of species discoveries um, because they were going there, collecting, bringing them back to their museums in London or Paris or Belgium, uh, s describing new species. As those powers left the countries, science declined and the new governments that were being formed didn't have the capacity yet to fund scientific research. Uh, and so we see this sort of plateau of science uh, as, as, as the, the knowledge left with the colonial powers. And the last thing that we look, wanted to look at was whether or not there's a socioeconomic bias uh, to spider taxonomy. And to do this, we looked at all the spider families and, and wh whether or not additional taxonomic work would yield fewer species descriptions or more species descriptions. And we uh, uh, colored these on the, on, um, the basis of, of what percentage of the species in that family belong to a country or a region in either the global north or the global south. There were a few problems with that. Uh, and some of those problems stemmed with, um, for example, in the World Spider Catalog, oftentimes China is listed as the distribution, but we had no way of knowing whether the part of China that was listed 
um, falls in the global south or the global north, um, given like the adjacent countries that this might be distributed in. Uh, and so this is really not looking at, at zoogeographic regions, it's really looking at economics. Uh, and what we found was that 53% of the families that are primarily global south distributed have a low taxon taxonomic effort, um, likely an artifact of them being in understudied regions. For example, Dictenids, the family that I'm gonna talk about a little later, were never known from Madagascar uh, up until essentially the study that we've embarked on for the last three years. Uh, and we've disco discovered dozens of undescribed species in our current project. The next thing that we've been focusing on is, is how to improve recognition, support, and access. And you know, taxonomic research is really a colonialist extractivist framework. It and that a framework persists in specimen-based research. The majority of Global North authors perpetuate this parachute science. For example, 40% of all core reef publications in Indonesia and the Philippines have no local co-author. And I think the problem here is really that Western, this model of Western science is upheld through the exclusion of local and traditional knowledge holders. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some alternative ways of, of, of looking at this. And this um, is a paper that was published by a large collective of over 40 authors uh, and led by uh, Jacob Gourneau in my lab, um, published in the Bulletin of the Society of Systematic Biology. So one of the things that we um, realized is that there, there needs to be alternative models for revisionary or large, oh, there's this, sorry. There's this like silk glob floating outside. I don't know if you all have seen this in the news. There's like silk globs fall, fall, flowing all over the Bay Area. I don't, people think they're spiders, but I don't think so. Uh, Sarah, you can tell me what you think. So spiders parachute. Yeah, they parachute all the time, but it's usually just a single silk. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. That was the first one I've seen though. Sorry, <laughs> it was a distraction. Uh, so one of the things that we realized is that there needs to be different models for how we do monography or the description of, of species in, in, in um, biodiversity science. Um, and that one of the models for that could be a model wherein there's different, there's equal participants standing around a circle. The circle is this body of knowledge, this what we could call monograph perhaps. Um, which was the sort of framework for this paper. And each of those people step forward and away from this body of knowledge as it's being constructed. And so that rather than a static entity where we describe species, we publish it, it lives in a library where nobody has access, it's really a living entity, it's a living framework. Um, and at any given time, any of these people can step forward to contribute information and receive credit for their work or step away as the perhaps the, the period of time of that project where they might be involved wanes, for example, in the field versus back in the lab. Um, and so we proposed a few different models for uh, a new version of, of monography uh, in this paper. So if you wanna read more, I hope that you'll uh, read about it. But I think, you know, really what we need to improve access is, is this. We have an intractable problem where resources to do biodiversity science are concentrated in the global north. Um, that's scientific collections and the historic literature. Although we've done a, a, a huge um, uh, um, step, we've made a lot of progress forward in terms of digitizing historical literature so that it's more accessible. On the other part, uh, diversity, and I mean biodiversity, is concentrated in the global south. So it's relatively underdocumented. We we show this in our in our world spider catalog paper uh, as sort of a, a, a proof of concept but it's also experiencing increased threats as, as uh, compared to the rest of the world. And so how do we shift away from traditional authorship to increase the pace at which we can describe and document biodiversity and perhaps reverse the decline? One of the ways is, to implement, is the implementation of the credit system. You probably, if you've published in recent years in any major journal, notice that there's sort of a shift towards the credit system where you list the credit of different authors for different, uh, playing different roles. Well, we took that credit system and we mapped it to the, the roles that different groups of people could play in biodiversity science. And I know it's quite hard to see here, but it, from that, that original figure of the people standing around the mo living monograph, 
each of those groups is represented here. And you can see that they might be involved at any given place and receive credit for the work that they do in that sort of step of the creation of a monograph, which is a really, really long process, in some cases taking decades. Um, but I think what it really comes down to is that what we wanna do is figure out a way to reward what we value rather than what we can easily measure. And to do that, we also have to change the way that we give credit to people that work in traditional academic systems. Uh, the current scientific success metrics are really narrow quantitative measures of academic impact, like how many publications you have, how many grants you've received, how many times you've been cited. There's almost no value, and I'm not speaking about the academy, I'm speaking broadly in academia. There's almost no value on professional activities that support access to scientific knowledge, that use this knowledge for positive societal impact, that engage society in science, or provide service to science. Those are metrics that are hidden, that are the hidden burden of people that care about those things, rather than something that we encourage and welcome in academic society. So the problem here is that the current scientific success metrics neither reflect nor do they incentivize behaviors that would avert or mitigate the biodiversity crisis. And in order to do that, we need to rethink how we give credit for academic success. And so to do that, a huge group of us here at the academy and in uh, organizations outside of the academy spanning academia came together and thought of a few different ways that this could look. And at the end, what we concluded was there could be five buckets that are sort of universal buckets. They're one, advancing scientific knowledge directly, serving science and society, supporting the advancement of and access to scientific knowledge, using scientific knowledge for positive societal impact and engaging science and society. And each, each of these can be directly mapped to the traditional academic metrics. So for example, um, if you are a traditional 40-40-20 research professor, meaning 40% research, 40% teaching and 20% service, you'd be on the upper left and you can see that of those five categories, you'd probably be represented by three of them. And that's what your job description dictates. But if you fall into, for example, collection staff up on the upper right, your pie chart might look differently and it might be distributed differently and the kinds of things that you do might be valued differently according to your job description. And so what we're really advocating for is changing the way that scientific society addresses metrics of scientific success in a way that help avert the biodiversity crisis and encourage stronger co collaborations with researchers in the global south, as well as recognition for those researchers within their own academic institutions. I'm really happy to say that here at the Academy, we've started piloting this. Thank you, Shannon, uh, for, for, for being willing to trust a process that we, that we came up with and envisioned and proposed. And I like to hope that it's going well so far. Um, maybe we'll know more after everybody submits their annual reviews this year. <laughs> so I think in sort of in summary for this section, and then I'm going to jump to a few highlights from the lab over the last year. Um, I just want to say like the new vision for arachnology that we hold in our lab is that we acknowledge the role that we play in perpetuating global power dynamics, that we uplift the voices of the most marginalized people in our arachnology community, that we recognize contributors through authorship or through an alternative system like the credit system, and that we actively seek out interregional inter -regional and interdisciplinary collaborators. And finally, that our group at least uh, is diverse, inclusive, and equitable. Uh, and so that's sort of our vision for our arachnology lab here at the Academy. Uh, and now I'll tell you about some of the science that we've been doing in 2023. So everything I'm gonna talk about is projects from 2023. Um, so first, marinoid spiders. If you've come to any of my grad students finishing talks in the last uh, eight months or so, you've probably heard a lot about marinoid spiders. Um, the, the real question is like, who cares about marinoid spiders? They're small, they're brown, they make little tiny webs, like nobody really knows what they do. And that is exactly what the problem is with marinoid spiders, is that for so long they've been neglected. Um, this is a group of spiders that was coined by Wheel, a Wheeler et al. paper in 2017. And it was actually coined because it unites a number of spider families that up until then didn't really have any unifying morphological features. Uh, so this was the first time that this clade had been united. It always had kind of weak support in their analyses, but it always came out together. So these, clade, these families were always associated. And Sarah Cruz in my lab had the brilliant idea that maybe we should figure out actually how they're related and actually what should be included and not. Um, the, the name 
marinoid comes from the Spanish word marron, which just means brown because they're little and brown. Um, I guess they're like fall into this tragedy of LBJs. Like I feel like there's an LBJ in every world, the, all the little brown jobs of birds and of nudibranchs and of probably plants. I don't know. Maybe those are just LBGs because they're green. Uh, but the problem with the marinoids is that they just have a lack of morphological basis. They include spiders that are both e and cribbolet, which has historically been a really important transitionary uh, morphological feature in spider evolution. Um, and their sister group is the sporacids, which I never remember to mention, but Jacob always likes to bring it up because he loves sporacids. Um, but interestingly, they also have a global distribution. So they're a really, really big and super diverse group. And in particular, they have these really diverse ecologies. They include members that are aquatic, like fully 100% aquatic, semi-aquatic, including living in salt flats, um, social spiders, and they, they include both extreme heat and extreme cold tolerant spiders. They, they occur at some of the highest latitudes in the world of any spider, and you can find them in Death Valley. Um, so for all of these diverse ecologies to occur in a single group is, is really exciting, I think, in terms of, of understanding evolutionary and ecological um, patterns and adaptation. But the internal relationships when we started this project were unclear. Most of the families were paraphyletic, and so we really wanted to just kind of shine a light on this dark node. Uh, and the, this picture here is of the diving bell spider, the only fully aquatic spider in the world. So I don't mean for you to see what any of this says, but I wanted to show you this figure that's in a paper we have in press right now um, in Insect Systematics and Diversity, and it shows all of the taxonomic changes that have occurred within this group since its inception, which is like to say it is a mess. Uh, and so cleaning it up was really a big, a big task. And, and the way that we approached this was, um, we started this project in 2020. This grant was funded in September of 2020, in the middle of a pandemic. And a lot of the things that we wanted to do right from the get-go were simply not possible, like access museum specimens, go do field work, and really um, get the project up, up and off the ground with the more than, I think, 30 collaborators that had originally agreed to participate. But what we came up with was a plan to use archival specimens and as many of the archival specimens here at the Academy that we could, but also any archival specimens that we could get anybody to get access to within their own collections, whether those be personal or museum collections. And so really try to harvest genomics from archival museum material. And what we, the way that we did that was through a custom pipeline that was built here by our lab, where we did whole low coverage genome sequencing and extracted UCEs from those genomes, but then additionally integrated legacy Sanger loci from anything that was published on GenBank historically. So not only were we able to extract genomic information from things in our collection, but we were also able to add in all of this legacy data that wouldn't have been used otherwise to add additional uh, species and terminals to our analysis. Again, don't expect you to be able to see this tree. Um, but the resulting tree is, is big. It's, I think, has over 220 terminals in it, spanning all the families in the marinoid clade with multiple taxa uh, per, per family. Um, and here's just sort of an abbreviated tree. Um, the main thing that I, wanna, that I wanna show you here is, if you recall, I said that this clade was proposed by Wheeler et al. in 2017 and that it never had strong support. And most of the relationships within it never had strong support. Uh, but all this purple here, anything in dark purple, is things that are supported um, very strongly by our UCE analysis. Um, there's only a few exceptions, and, and those kind of occur uh, sort of more towards the tips. And a couple of things come are sort of highlighted here. One is that uh, the family Macrobunidae has never been a family before. Uh, we just created that family. Um, and we also elevated a couple of other families that were previously had been um, submerged into, into others, uh, synonymized. Uh, so we've been able to really clear up the backbone. We have really strong support for all of these groups. And now we can start to do the really important work with this evolutionary framework of beginning to understand some of the ecologies. And I'll touch on those in just a second. We also did a sort of deeper dive into this, looking at just one family, the family Dictinity. Um, here it is here, these are uh, uh, citizen science uh, observations drawn from GBIF. Um, and you can see it has a, a, also a worldwide distribution. This time we're just talking about one family instead of a collective of 11 families. Again, worldwide distribution. Although, as you can see here, there's a lot of observations from um, the Southern Hemisphere, although historically it's almost entirely unknown from the Southern Hemisphere. There's only a few species 
known from the southern hemisphere, including Madagascar, where we now have like, well, soon we'll know whether we have dozens of species of means, got some sequences going in the lab right now. Uh, again, we have super diverse ecologies. There's 53 genera in this family, 475 species. It's a big family. Um, it includes uh, uh, species from Greenland, so like really high Arctic things, uh, as well as things like down in Death Valley. That's the ones I mentioned before. Um, and due in part to this really huge diversity, it's even more of a tailor's drawer than all of the marinoids. It's really sort of a dumping ground for anything that's either cribbolet or e -cribble it. Uh, it doesn't matter what the, what the morphological structures are. If it's small and brown and nobody knows what to do with it, they might have thrown it in dig tenants. Uh, and here's just a few of the ones I mentioned earlier. Again, the diving bell spider. There's uh, Saltonia inserta, which was rediscovered after it was thought to be extinct by Sarah Cruz uh, in salt flats all over California, Arizona, and New Mexico. Uh, and here's the result of that. You can see that was just sort of one of the tips of that previous phylogeny that I showed you. We've now expanded that uh, really significantly. And again, don't expect you to, to, to take away much from this other than to say, if you look over here on the right, you can see this just like admixture of colors. That's because we have like really no resolution in general. The, each color represents a different genus. They should all be together, the different colors, but they're not together. Um, so somebody has a lot of work to do there. Um, but we also have identified two new families. Um, one of them is the family Lathis, Lathidae. That shouldn't have the S in there. I made a typo. Uh, Lathidae was previously a genus in the family Dictinidae, and it was actually sort of the, the impetus for this entire project that we've been doing. We wanted to revise that genus. Well, we've now re realized that that genus is a family with multiple genera contained therein. Uh, and we re-elevated another family, Ar the Argyronetidae, which was previously synonymized. So we've been doing a lot of work at the high, sort of higher taxonomic levels. Um, we've also been looking at some of those important characters. This is a, a, a study that was done by our undergraduate intern in the SSI program this summer, Sophia delval Mottershead. And what she looked at was the evolu wh whether or not there was correlations between morphological structures and some of these aquatic associations of these spiders, because I think that is one of the more interesting aspects of their ecology, is this repeated adaptation to aquatic lives or lifestyles. And what she found is that there's five independent evolutions of aquatic association in this group, and that some of those uh, uh, evolutions are roughly correlated. And you can't, there's like more, colors on the screen up here. Some of those um, evolutions are roughly correlated with, ev with evolution or really rapid transformation in this cribellum structure. Uh, if you remember earlier, I said the cribellum is a really, has historically been thought of as a really important um, transitionary structure in spiders. It produces silk um, and changes the way that spiders produce silk for, for their webs. And what we see in, in this family is that the, the cribellum just does all sorts of things. They seem to be sort of predisposed to having um, no cribellum. Uh, and then we, we find that they, they gain it and lose it over and over and over again. Uh, and it takes all different forms. So uh, Sophia is working on that, that, that paper now, continuing that analysis. Another thing that we've been working on from the Marinoid group is uh, uh, a morphology. Um, so remember I told you there's no morphological basis for this group. Well, we've been really hard at work at that. Um, Dr. Franklin Kalarik Kalme, a postdoc on this project in our lab, um, has been looking at all sorts of morphological structures, both historic and novel structures. Uh, and he now has a morphological matrix of over 188 independent characters um, from across this entire phylogeny. So we've coded all 220 plus another 140 spe uh, terminals, um, both from, photogra from, from photographs uh, published online in uh, like species descriptions, but also from uh, actual specimens uh, and SEMs here at the academy. And you can see here's just a sampling of some of the characters that he's looking at, including cholesterol teeth, tarsal claws, palps, which are the primary reproductive structure of spiders for sperm transfer, uh, and the cribellum. And the way that he's looking at these characters is really taking a novel approach. He's looking at the phylogenetic informativeness of each character independently um, and dependently. So uh, oftentimes, it's hard to say whether a structure on an organism is present or absent, like there's kind of in-between things. And so historically, what we would say is, in, in a single character, we would say it's, it's absent, or it's present and it looks like this, or it's present and it looks like that, or present and maybe it looks like this. And he's really trying to, to um, create 
uh, dependent or nested characters where he's looking at independence um, on the one hand and comparing it to dependent nested characters to see really what is truly phylogenetically informative uh, or which version of that. Uh, and in the, as part of this work, he's, he's uh, gone over to Germany uh, where he's done micro CT scans of every known fossil uh, of this group. Uh, and he found that like something like 60% of them are not actually, don't actually belong to this group because again, we're talking about little brown jobs and people just figured that was a good place to put them. Jumping to a totally different group, uh, we have a paper that's impressed right now. We just found out two days ago that it was accepted in Zoki's of an, yet another um, California endemic scorpion, uh, again from the Central Valley, from this little tiny area um, near Tular Lake. And what we found is that there's multiple populations, but none of those populations exist anywhere that is currently protected. Um, so it's not looking good for this, for this little scorpion, um, but hopefully this publication can contribute to some protection. Uh, and in fact, this paper includes, uh, to my knowledge, the first time ever that uh, a formal um, uh, CITES evaluation has been performed in, in, uh, in the same publication as the description of a, a species for a, for a scorpion. Um, we also have this paper which came out this year um, from Sarah, uh, which includes 19 new species of flatty spiders from Australia. Uh, she she does, uh, last I heard, she doesn't even really want to look at any more specimens because every time she looks at another specimen from Western Australia, it's another species. Uh, it seems like there's a new species on every single rock pile across all of Western Australia. Uh, and so my understanding is she's got a lot more work to do in, to, before she can get them all described. But this area is really, really sensitive because there's a lot of mining activity in it. So a lot of the places that she's getting this material is through um, sort of mine pre-mining surveys um, or uh, the mines have already come through, been built, and likely these spiders are extinct before they're even recognized. Um, so hard at work describing lots of spiders from Australia. Uh, and I just wanted to mention a few other accolades in the lab from this year. Um, Sophia Del Val Mottershead, who I mentioned doing the sort of correlative research between uh, morphological structures and aquatic adaptation, received a scholarship to present her work at SACNAS next month, this month. Oh, we're already in October, whoops. Um, Amin Al-Jamal, who's sitting in the back over there, was admitted to San Francisco State University for his master's um, and received the ARCS Foundation scholarship to support his tuition for the year. A super illustrious scholarship. Um, we're super happy to have been funded for his work. And he's going to continue working on, on uh, species description in the Dictinid family, in particular looking, giving a really deep look at the like p p dozens of putatively new species from Madagascar. Uh, probably several new genera endemic to Madagascar in this group. Uh, Luigi Alakin was admitted to San Francisco State University as part of the island's 2030 cohort. I converted him to the dark side to work on spiders, even though he wanted to work on plants. Uh, and he received a San Francisco State University Conservation Scholarship uh, and is headed to the field for the first time on Friday. Uh, Jacob Gourneau was admitted to UC Berkeley for his PhD and just started last month. Eric Steiner advanced to candidacy for his PhD at Open University, and Kate Montana graduated with her master's from San Francisco State, and I just heard that she was accepted to the Stanford Biology PhD preview program, uh, which I'm excited for her to think about her next steps. And I, wouldn't, I would be remiss not mentioning what's on the horizon in our lab this calendar year, so just talking about the projects that we'll have out um, for review in the next few months. Uh, first, we're going to continue work on the Marinoid group. That project is in full swing. We've only got a, about a year left on it, um, despite our slow start with COVID. Uh, we just had a meeting yesterday with Dr. Lena Almeida, who was a postdoctoral scholar here at the Academy about a decade ago. Um, and we're going to support her in the macrobunid revision that she started while she was here. Um, I, if you'll remember, we, we um, elevated that subfamily to a family in our, in our paper that Jacob led. Uh, so we reached out to Alina, she's a co-author on that paper, uh, and we want to support her in getting that data out and published that she produced while she was here at the Academy. Um, Franklin is working on a paper to revise all those fossils that were not dictenids or marinoids, um, but also to, re to, to sort of re-describe or at least re-diagnose the ones that actually are. Um, 
We're doing a, a morphological analysis, that 180 characters that I mentioned, looking at dependence and independence and phylogenetic informativeness. Uh, Franklin's got that matrix done. We were just waiting for our final dictinent phylogeny from Kate, which got came off this, the, the um, cluster last week. Um, we're working on this new, these new genera of dictinents from Madagascar. We've got sequences in the lab right now, did extractions last week. Uh, and we're, lastly, we, we just finished a paper that should go out for publication uh, next week on this really enigmatic marinoid called Pacificana um, that lives on the Bounty Islands off the coast of New Zealand, which is like just like a rock. Like it's just a, one of those guano islands. It's just full of bird poop. There's no plants. The only insects there like eat the bird poop. And then there's this spider. And nobody could figure out what group this spider belonged to. Uh, we did an analysis, we've solved the mystery, but I'm not gonna reveal it yet since we're streaming live. Uh, when, coming from the scorpion front, we have more new species of, of scorpion endemic to California. That paper has already been finished uh, being written. Uh, we're just waiting on a phylogeny, which we're in the, in the midst of, of about 400 terminals of the genus Periurachinus from California and Nevada and Utah. Uh, we're, we have a gene evolution gene, an, an elevation gene evolution correlation study that's being done by Sophia Del Val in her uh, genomics class at UC Berkeley this fall um, using Eurocktinus Mordax data that we collected from whole low cover genome data that we collected uh, through the CCGP. And finally, the Eurocktinus Mordax genome, the, the deep coverage genome that was done in collaboration with the CCGP, the California Conservation Genomics Project uh, is done. Um, they've finished assembling it. I hear it's kind of a little bit of a mess because ar arachnid genomes are impossibly difficult, um, but we will be publishing it nonetheless. Uh, a few other things. Um, we're launching our community-driven research project in Baja, California. That's Eric Steiner's project, uh, where he just received ethics clearance from Open University to conduct community listening surveys to try to identify a community project that we uh, can conduct in terms of natural history. Uh, we're going to the Caribbean this weekend to do Luigi's first ever field work, which he's super excited about. Um, we've been working on sort of a continuation paper, which is starting last spring and involving all the interns in our lab this summer on the history of bias in arachnology publishing. So we're continuing that trajectory from the World Spider Catalog. This time what we're looking at is uh, the history of, of women, species women first authored species descriptions. So we've taken every single author from every single of the 50,000 species We've determined their, their gender uh, manually. We've assigned their gender. Some of them were really hard to track down. And um, we're also looking at uh, the mismatch between the institution of the, the, uh, the person who described the species and the zoogeographic region of the species to see what proportion of species are described by people in the global north describing things in the global south. So really to kind of taking that a step further in terms of that taxonomic bias. Uh, we are working on a paper looking at the utility of low coverage genomes for phylogenetics and at the same time for decolonizing access to natural history resources. So in publishing uh, whole low coverage genomes for phylogenetics, it allows people from the countries of origin access to whole genomes rather than just the UCE um, markers that we use as a utility in phylogenetics. Um, and we're comparing that to other markers that are currently used like transcriptomes um, or BUSCO scores or other things like that. Uh, we're doing a paper on the phylogenomics of arthropods. I don't, honestly, I don't know why, but Michelle and I came up with this harebrained, Michelle Troutwine and I came up with this harebrained idea that we should maybe like, why don't we just look at all arthropods? Um, and this was largely driven because by Jacob being absolutely fascinated with pentastomas. Has anybody ever heard of pentastomas? They're these like really weird crustaceans that live in like the eyeballs and lungs of like oftentimes reptiles. Crustaceans, that's bizarre. Uh, so nobody knows what pentastomas like are related to and so we decided we would just figure that out. Uh, and lastly we have a, a paper being led by our other researcher this summer, um, uh, Ari. Oh my gosh I just blanked on his last name. Okay, Ari. Uh -huh. And what he looked at was uh, the, the gut contents of salmonids from uh, marine streams, uh, like mostly little fry, 
and the spider uh, proportions of those salmon and gut contents. So really like to what extent spiders are used as a food source for uh, spawning, well, not spawning, but like little baby hatchling salmonids. Uh, and finally, I'm really excited that we were just a, received a, a, a grant to look at uh, leaf litter arthropods across the state of California. So we're gonna be going out and sampling. Uh, this is my favorite diorama in the whole world. If you've never been to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, um, if you ever do rather, you should go find this. It's in the basement. It's like 150 years old or something. And it's just these giant things from the leaf litter floor. Um, but we're gonna go be going out here in California, looking at um, soil arthropods and leaf litter arthropods from across the state. And in particular, what we're gonna be looking at is the effect of megafires on the community assembly of soil arthropods, um, leaf litter arthropods, and the effect of grazing uh, on leaf litter arthropods. Um, and I'm really excited because one of the ideas that we just came up with as a lab uh, a couple of weeks ago was that through this field work that will be done all over the state, we're gonna uh, open up a survey uh, for, for non-research staff through, across the academy to join us for our short field trips when we go to collect this leaf litter. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to extend this opportunity to conduct um, field work to everyone from across the academy. And um, I'm like excited to meet people, honestly. I think that that's it. A lot of stuff. Here's the lab. There's a couple of people missing from this picture, uh, notably Luigi Alakin and Eric Steiner, um, but everyone else is, is in there. Uh, also, I would be remiss without thanking all of the former lab members who have really done a, played a huge role in contributing to the way that we're thinking about how we do our research um, and our overall philosophy as a lab. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. We're going to move to questions right now. I see Darrell. I see you. And you, or in 2018 or 2017, they were thought to be a group. It's obvious you need to look at things that aren't brown to, to, to define them as a group. So did what was not brown that was definitely not in the marinoids that got looked at to begin with? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I should have clarified that. That study by Wheeler et al. in 2017 was the, was, was the, a phylogeny of all spiders, okay. the first molecular phylogeny of all spiders. Uh, so it included, like, I, I, I don't know. Sarah, do you know how many terminals was in that? Yeah, if you ever walk by Charles's office door on B2 Central, there's a really long tree that's printed out on paper and taped together. That, that's, that's the phylogeny. But if I ever have to tell anybody this story, the marinoids are a true group. They are. There are other brown spiders there are. that aren't marinoids. Absolutely. There's lots of, there's, you know what, there's tons of brown spiders, if we're being honest here. There's, there's fewer non-brown spiders than there are brown spiders. Um, but in particular, these are sort of like the little brown spiders that... That's true. Yeah, if you go out right here in the park, there's this beautiful green uh, dictinid called Nigma. What's the second part of Lindsdali, um, which is not. A, we've recently learned it's not actually Nigma. It's actually probably a new genus, but whatever. Anyways, it's super pretty. It's gr like bright, bright green with some red markings on it. Amin can take you and show you where to find that. I selfishly have a question for you. Sure. <laughs> I wanted to say congrats to everyone in your lab and you as well for all the great work you're doing. And thank, thank you. you so much for this talk. Um, I have to ask, because of the sidebar earlier, what is your hypothesis about what's going on with these? Is it silk the globs? Silk globs? <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's probably from a lepidoptera. No? Does anyone else have any thoughts? I mean, Sarah? I mean, has anybody actually grabbed one and looked at it? I know, right? Get the one that just flew by. It's like a big glob of like, I would say if it's any silk, it's curable at silk, but it seems unlikely to be. I don't know. It's too much. Aren't there spiders like up in? Okay, I mean, you go grab one. <laughs> Figure it. Yeah. I think it's a lepidopteran, honestly. I think it's some kind of caterpillar. Any other questions? Oh, okay, Chris, here we go, Shannon. 
Um, I'm curious about uh, the biogeography of spider evolution. And I noted that you've done, you know, you've looked at islands and continents mm -hmm. and, and not islands, all islands are equal for sure. So you've got little Pacificus looks probably very different from Madagascar. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering if you could sum up the cliff notes of how, uh, how spiders evolve on islands versus mainlands. And if we have a picture of cliff that. Notes. Hmm. I mean, I think that the, the, the underlying problem is that for most spider lineages, we have really incomplete knowledge about the diversity. Um, you know, we're, we're talking like for many under under 50% 50, 50 of the species have been recognized. And for some, it's much, much less than that. So to make, I think to make a generalization about how, how spiders evolve on islands versus on the mainland is, is hard to make at this point. But at least in a few spider groups, it's very clear that there's like radiations of spiders in, with, within islands. So, um, for example, Franklin works on a radiation of jumping spiders that's in the Caribbean. Um, this radiation of, of, I assume it's a radiation, it's hard to say quite yet, but this radiation of, of dictenids in Madagascar is another example. So we definitely see a lot of like island endemics, oftentimes spiders are either single island endemics or there's multiple species exist coexisting on, on the same island. Um, like for example, in Hawaii, if we, if we talk about Hawaiian tetragonathids. And I, I, went, I forgot to say how much I enjoyed your talk and, oh. and really appreciate your team's leadership oh, in you. both charming spiders and changing the face of science. So thank you. Any other questions from the room? Just, oh, here we go. Have you had any dreams where God has told you what you should study next? I like I don't know what's wrong. Did he with tell me you yet? To, they tell you to study the marinoids. That that just hasn't happened to me. Yeah. Did that happen to you with selenopid, sir? Yeah. <laughs> Sarah has dreams of piles of rocks because <laughs> that's where her spiders live. Just piles of rocks. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I really enjoyed this, Lauren. This is great. Um, and I'm just curious what your thoughts were about how you measure biodiversity. Like, is it genetic, or is it um, sort of by functional characteristics? Is it um, by count of species, or like, what do you sort of interact with those different um, frameworks in different ways, or? I mean, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. That's I think like as a as a student of the American Museum of Natural History, I've thought about this way more than anybody ever should because it's sort of like pounded into your brain. Um, and I would say that I like do subscribe to that general school of thought that the American Museum of Natural History does, which is the sort of phylogenetic species concept, meaning that if something is a unique genetic lineage and there's morphological characteristics that allow you to visually separate it, then, it, so, then it's in a, a separate species. But if, the, if one of those is missing, then there's probably no point. I mean, either, either it's, it's, if, it, if it's not a single evolving lineage or if there's no morphological characteristics separating it, then I think that you'd have to make a case for why to recognize it. Um, and that, that case can be made, for example, if there's in, like really important populations of things that are necessary to preserve the genetic diversity, then, then the way that um, bureaucracy recognizes that diversity is through species. So it would be important to, to, to recognize those separate populations, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I, th I, I mean, I subscribe to the phylogenetic species hypothesis. Any other questions in the room? Lots of big kudos and love in chat. Um, thank you so much, Lauren. And if you would all join me in thanking Lauren for this great talk today. Okay.